you for uh, this opportunity to to study your word, to delve into some matters that are essential for our consideration with respect to salvation. I thank you for those who come from far and from near to join us, those who have set aside time out of their busy schedules to pause and to reflect on you. May your Holy Spirit be present in our midst. Give us insights and understandings to your words. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. The, uh, the title tonight is False Peace, and the, uh, in the invitation, if you received one, you'll, you'll recall that we, um, we, were, we, we used Matthew chapter 7. Uh, just a, as a matter of backdrop, I think it's important uh, to, to, to establish the setting. The Matthew chapter 7 is the last of, of three chapters that uh, tell the, the Sermon on the Mount. It, it, it provides, Jesus went up into this mountain and he begins to uh, talk to the people and to his disciples. Uh, most of the, those gathered were his disciples. You know, in addition to the twelve, any follower was a disciple. And, and there they were. And he begins uh, Matthew chapter 5, we know the Beatitudes. Uh, those are essentially uh, traits, character traits, of, of those who will be in the kingdom. Um, uh, pure in heart, peacemakers, uh, those who mourn, and so forth. And um, and he and he goes along, but at the end, and that's what we're going to focus on tonight, Matthew chapter seven. At the end, he gives uh, some warnings, and he makes some some very very um, stern statements, uh, and and we're going to look at one of those tonight, and the one that we're going to look at is found in Matthew chapter seven. And in verses 21 to 23, uh, you may be familiar with them when I read them, but it's important to, to, to delve into them so that we can have a better understanding of just what's going on. <clears throat> so I'm going to uh, put up the, uh, um, the PowerPoint, and uh, you are certainly able to... to um, to enter the chat and chat with us, and, and I encourage you to do so, because you will discover that it, it again, uh, makes makes for a much better uh, presentation, as, as I see it. So, here's our title. It is entitled, False Peace. <clears throat> so that, by the title alone, I was, I'm hopeful that it, it connotes, you know, those two words seem to be opposite. Uh, peace is usually a very positive thing, um, something that's desired. What, what, what could false peace be? It means that we should be troubled, right? Okay, so here we go. As I said, the, the text for consideration uh, this evening is Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 to 23. So let's read it. Let's read it through once, and then we can, of course, come back to it uh, and, and, and look into it uh, more deeply. But it goes this way. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? and in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles then i will tell them then i will t tell them plainly i never knew you away from me you evil doers in the i think here in the slide i i'm using the new american standard and so the uh, some of the words are a little bit different for instance instead of evil doers at the end of verse 23 it is used those who practice you who practice lawlessness lawlessness being uh, similar to evil doers 
Now that's a tough statement, isn't it? Hmm? A very tough statement. That um, somehow people who are doing what it seems that God would have us do are told you 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 you're uh, your works your behaviors your you you're not coming depart from me away from me you evil doers Christ is not talking here to infidels He's not talking to unbelievers. He, he's, he's actually talking to believers. And that's the amazing thing. So what this text is, is telling us is that believers can be lost. Wow. That's a big, big, big statement. That you can be a believer on, the, in, in, on Jesus Christ or in Jesus Christ and still be lost, according to Matthew chapter 7 and verses 21 to 23, which we just read. That's a very tough statement. And then Jesus is talking to sincere Christians who, who believe the right thing, who say the right thing, and, and, and who are doing the right thing. But they find themselves outside the kingdom. In other words, they're lost. They're not recipients of eternal life. And that seems difficult to swallow. Is that possible? Are we reading this correctly? That there can be believers, not infidels, not unbelievers, but believers who don't make it into the kingdom. And according to Jesus, because this is Jesus speaking in Matthew chapter 7, in verses 21 to 23, the answer is yes. So let's look at the verses and, and see what's meant. What is Jesus saying? So we go to verse 21. <clears throat> in verse 21, <clears throat> it says that not everyone will be saved. Okay, not everyone who says this, who prophesies in my name, who cast out demons, not everyone. Was that a few people or a lot of people? How many people do you think that is? When you say not, not everyone, sometimes we believe that that's only a few people. But if you look at the next verse, verse 22, Jesus identifies what he means by not everyone. So our question is, is it a lot or a little? Verse 22. Let's, let's go to the next slide. Verse 22, and maybe we should read verse 22 aloud. It starts out, many will say to me on that day. Ah, so the answer is, there will be many. When Jesus says not everyone, there are going to be many Christians who are not going to make it into the kingdom. Now this gets really serious. So this is why we need to take a look at this text and see what is meant. The next thing is, <clears throat> Jesus had said, back to verse 21, not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom. What's significant or what's meant by that address? Well, let me tell you. When you use that address, in the, it's a New Testament statement, correct? It has some Old Testament connotations. It is synonymous with the Old Testament word for Jehovah when, it, when you say, Lord, Lord. Someone says, to address Christ as Lord is to profess the belief that he is indeed the Messiah. And it implies that the speaker has assumed the role, assumed the role of a disciple. So when, 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 some, when, when those 
individuals who address Jesus as Lord, Lord, Jesus is talking about them when he says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, he uh, will enter the kingdom. So <clears throat> these are people, when by using that term, who are assumed to be disciples. I got that last statement from a Bible commentary. <clears throat> and, and that's what's really, really troubling. Because it seems to suggest that the person who's not going really, truly believes that they're going. Wow, what a bitter disappointment that would be. And so we find that uh, <clears throat> we might want to, 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 to see if we can find out, if we can do more to identify this group of people who was so bitterly disappointed. I suggest that, <clears throat> excuse me, that, that we can divide people into three groups here on earth. First group are those people who believe in Christ and they are going to be saved. They enter the kingdom. Second group would be those individuals who are unbelievers. Um, they, they just don't believe, and so they're not going. But it's expected that they would not go. But there will be, with the unbelievers, which is a large group of people, individuals who believe, but are still not going. They'll find themselves on the outside of the New Jerusalem, numbered with the infidels, the unbelievers, and the heathens. But they were believers. How is that possible? Three groups. Perhaps the, the most sorry group, the most... Uh, the, the saddest group has to be that third group, that group of individuals who uh, believe and they're not going. Let's move on. Now Jesus says that they're not going and he tells you why. And he says... <clears throat> Are you following with me now? The ones that are not going, they're not entering the kingdom of heaven because they are not doing the will of the Father. Because they're not doing the will of the Father. So that begs the question. Even though they drive out demons and perform miracles, isn't that the work of the Father? Isn't that the Father's will that we do that? We preach with power, cast out demons, can even perform miracles. Wouldn't that be the will of the Father? Of course it is. He would want that from us. But read with me this text, Matthew chapter 12, verses 49 to 50. Um, John, if you're back and you can post that, I'd appreciate it. I'm going to assume that you're not back and I'll try to go fetch it. But Matthew chapter, what did I say? <clears throat> chapter 12, verses 49 to 50. Okay, <clears throat> let's read. And stretching out his hand toward his disciples, he said, Behold my mother and my brothers. Because, see, the people had pointed out that his mother and brothers were there. This is at the Sermon on the Mount, near the end here. 
And this is his and this is his response. Behold, as he was stretching out his hand towards his disciples, he says of them, Behold, my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my Father who is in heaven, he is my brother and sister and mother. Wow. So Jesus points to his disciples. When the crowd says to him, hey, 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 here's your mother, here's Mary, and, and your brothers, and your sister, and he says, no, 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 my mother, and my brothers, and my sisters are my disciples. So, what is a disciple of Christ? Let's go, let's keep looking at text. I think text uh, are so important. Matthew chapter 10 and verse 38. Read with me. Anyone who loves his father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves his son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And anyone who does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Ah, I see now. So you have to take up your cross and deny yourself and follow Christ to be a true disciple. And when you're a disciple, he says, you are my brother, my sister, my mother. That's who you are. Are you getting that? See, a person who is able to pro prophesy a person who's who's able to cast out demons don't you think that that person is a disciple what do you think come on just sign into the chat and let me know is that person that what you would consider to be a disciple a follower of Jesus Christ hmm Talk to me. But of course that would be our, our thinking. We would expect that a person who preached and prophesied and, 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 and cast out demons was indeed a follower of Christ or a disciple. Jesus suggests again that unless we pick up his cross and follow him, we're not worthy to be called his, his disciples. Let's take a, a look at another view of the will of the Father and who a disciple is. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 23. 1 John 3, 23. See if I can find it over here. Yeah. We got to believe on Christ and love one another. Ah. So, so what the will of the Father is, and I'm reading from 1 John chapter 3 and verse 23. I'll read the text for you. And this is his command, to believe in the name of his Son, that's what the Father's command is, Jesus Christ, and to love one another as he commanded us. Hmm. This is the command. This is his command. This is God's command. To believe in the name of his son Jesus Christ. And to love one another. So we want to believe on Christ. And we must love one another. That's God's will. Another text. Familiar. Uh, John chapter 15 is where there's a lot of discourse about fruit, the vine, the branches, and bearing fruit, and so forth. Look at verse 5. <clears throat> the will of God is that we should believe in Jesus Christ and love one another. John 15, 5 says, I am the vine, you are the branches. 
If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. So, so what's this thing about fruit bearing? Okay, because God wants us to bear fruit. Look at verse eight. Oh, so stay with me. I'm still in in uh, John chapter fifteen. But look at verse eight. This is my Father's glory. In other words, His will that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. Aha. Uh -huh. By there's another text that says, by by their fruits you shall know them. We will we will be known by the the fruit that we bear. Did you get that? If we're followers of Jesus Christ, then we are going to bear fruit. And in John 15, as long as we're attached to Christ, he's the vine, we're the branches, we're going to bear fruit. And it says the, the father is the husbandman and he prunes us so that we can bear much fruit. Okay. Those who are bearing fruit, he prunes so that they can bear much fruit. Why? Because these are those who are his disciples. Let's keep going. So you got to remember then that a disciple is not only a follower of Christ, but it's one is is a person who bears much fruit. In verses nine through twelve, we're still in John chapter fifteen. <clears throat> As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in love. If you obey my commands. You will remain in my love, just as I have obeyed my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that, you, you, and, and, and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. So Jesus is saying, a disciple loves as he has loved. And that's that unconditional agape love, intentional love, not a love based on feeling. Okay? Because all of us at some point are unlovable. During the course of some day, every one of us is unlovable. However, God loves us anyway even on those days. So it's a lot different than that kind of love that reciprocates love. But God's love is unconditional. is isn't meaning that it is not conditioned by our response. And that's what we're talking about here. Twofold <clears throat> things about the will of God. Believe in Jesus Christ and we've got to reflect God's love. Are you with me? You got that? This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Exactly. All right? Now, <clears throat> moving right along. We're building <clears throat> an answer to what is the will of God. Let's just recap where we've come from. We said that there was this statement at the end of John, chapter 7, which is the end of the Sermon on the Mount, in which Jesus says, not everyone that says, Lord, Lord, is going to be, is going to enter the kingdom. Um, let me read it again. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of the Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me in, on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. Now, that's a strong and tough statement. We identified three groups of people on earth 
those who are believers and are saved, those who are unbelievers and are not saved. But then there's a group that actually is amongst those unbelievers that are not saved, and they were believers, but they're not saved. And so the answer is, how can that be? And so we began to take it apart, and we found in that text <clears throat> that uh, in order to be saved, uh, Jesus is saving those who do the will of the Father. Okay? And it, in, that, in verse 21, it says that, But only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. So we wanted to know what was God's will. And what we've uncovered so far is that you must believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you must reflect the love of God. All right. So let's keep let's continue now. In other words, a true Christian will have lost all confidence in himself and is depending totally on Jesus Christ, not only for his salvation, but also for his life. In other words, Christ, Christ lives in us. Remember back in verse 22, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and drive out demons and perform many miracles? Now, what does that have to do? Would you say that prophesying, driving out demons, performing miracles, is, is this right or wrong? Is this is this is this is this something that that uh, a believer should be doing? Rachel, great to see you. Mm -hmm. uh, let me angle your video. Is this something that a believer would do? Of course, definitely. Definitely. It was it's the right thing to do, is it not? Then then how can it be that Christ would say to those individuals, depart from me, I don't know you? Huh? How, how can that be? Where's the deficit? What's the problem? Welcome, John. <clears throat> hmm? These people claim to be Christians that are going about prophesying and, and and by the way prophesying here is not just foretelling the, the future okay but it's speaking in Jesus's name right we share the gospel of Jesus Christ and that, and that's the broadest sense of the word prophesying uh, you can find that in in 1 Corinthians 14 okay um, speaking out for Christ proclaiming the name of Jesus Christ okay so that's that's the that's the uh, the intent of the word prophesying in, in this use, not just uh, exactly right action, wrong motive. Love it, John. There we are. Now we're getting somewhere. They do the right things, but perhaps their hearts weren't where? In the right place? Their hearts weren't really into it. Okay. Now we have some clues. Here are two people, for instance, speaking in the name of Jesus Christ, and they're witnessing, they're preaching, talking, giving a testimony. Is that right or wrong? There's no problem with that, right? That's a good thing. Driving out demons. There seems to be a lot of them around these days, right? <laughs> and to the extent that we can call on, on, on the Lord and uh, there, there, there's several different kinds of like deliverance ministries where people are trying to trying to, to escape addiction, trying to escape violence of different kinds and, 
and so forth. Uh, uh, and, and, and there are those who intercede or pray for those individuals and work with those individuals. That's a good thing. Driving out demons. But look at this. Some of those people will be deceived. I'm talking about these gallant workers will be deceived and lost. How is that possible? Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 3. 1 Corinthians 12 verse 3. And then I'm going to come to this. I got to this slide before, perhaps before I should have. Let me read 1 Corinthians 12, 3. Therefore I tell you that no one who is speaking by the Spirit of God says, Jesus be cursed, and no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. So that's suggesting that people who go around prophesying, driving out demons in the name of Jesus Christ are doing it with the power of the Holy Spirit. How on earth can these people be lost? Here's some answers. How can such people be deceived and lost? 1 Corinthians 13 verses 1 and 2. It's a familiar text and chapter, right? If I speak with the tongues of men and angels and have not love, I am only resounding a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. <clears throat> Verse 2. Sounding brass or tinkling cymbal. You're empty. If I have the gift of prophecy. Hmm, sounds like prophesying, huh? And can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge. And if I have faith that can move mountains, but I have not love, and that's agape love, that's agape love, I am nothing. So it is possible to do these things. Uh, let me give another uh, text here, and that's what I put in the in the in the uh, in the outline Matthew 24 in verse 24 this is an end time statement talking about the disciples that asked when how can we know when you're coming and Jesus says well here's some signs for you and what are those signs Matthew 24 24 false for false Christ and false prophets will appear and perform great signs and miracles to deceive even the elect, if it were possible. So, you see, the signs and the miracles and the wonders are not the final evidence of whether or not you will be saved. The, it's got to be, if you, if you preach and ten people come forward saying, we want baptism. Is that evidence that you're going to, the, to be in the kingdom? What this text and this study is trying to point out is no, does not mean you'll be there. It goes deeper than just that act. That's why Paul said that every day he died because he didn't want to be caught prophesying, preaching the word, bringing folk to Christ, baptizing them, and find himself on the outside. It takes more than just those works. Jesus said that there would be signs and miracles performed, but those would be false Christ and false prophets. All right. How can I be sure 
then I'm not going to be among those many. How can we be sure that we won't be among the many? It says many won't make it to the kingdom. Not everyone that says, Lord, Lord, shall enter. And then he, he defines not everyone by saying many will be lost. How can we avoid being one of the many? I'm going to presume that everybody listening is busy at work for the Lord. In whatever capacity or with the talents that he, or the gifts that he's given you. And you're busy in ministries. You're busy in personal acts of kindness. You're busy in your personal ministry of spreading the gospel of him whom we serve. But how can we be sure, huh? That we're not that we won't be like one of those people that don't make it in. How can I be sure that I'm not one of the many? Jesus gives a clue. In verse 23, he says, Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. Or workers of iniquity, I think it says in the King James. You see, these were Christians. These individuals were Christians. But their foundation was not Jesus Christ. They taught in his name. They cast out devils in his name but they were not established on the foundation of not I, but Christ. Look at 1 Corinthians 3 and verse 11. 1 Corinthians 3, verse 11. Let's read that. This is how we can be sure. For no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. Okay, so this is beginning to be the clue. You see, it's upon that foundation that, that all Christianity is built up. Their faith, in other words, people described in Matthew 7, their faith was in their performance. See, John talked about it way, way back at the beginning when I asked the question, how could it be? And he, was, he said that their, their motives were not correct. It's true that in James it says that uh, faith without works is dead. And so many of us are very, very busy, busy all the time. Working, working, working for the master. But in that work, if we're, if we're not careful, we can begin to feel, I'm on the right track, I will be saved. After all, I'm spending more and more and more time doing the work of the kingdom. But we need to pause because it's, it's because of Christ that we are saved, not our work. We're judged by our works, that's a whole nother study. But, Christ must be our foundation. Our beginning, our end, is Jesus Christ. Not what we're able to do through the blessing of the Holy Spirit. In, I think it's in Hebrews. Hebrews, uh, I can't think of the, that's where it's found, but I want to say around Hebrews, it's in Hebrews 11 or Hebrews, yeah, I think somewhere around, anyway, uh, because I can't, I won't quote that, uh, even summarize that text, 
maybe I will uh, come to it in my notes. So, here we go. <clears throat> the reason that's given why they, uh, given to us, why they want to enter in, is that they're pointing to their works. Those are the individuals in, in Matthew chapter 7. They're pointing to their works and saying, hey, because I'm doing all of these works, it means I'm close to the Lord, and I'm, I'm on my way. I'm walking the straight and narrow. Things are going well for me. They're saying, Lord, I'm doing all this in your name. Don't you think they have a right to heaven? And Jesus says to them instead, I never knew you. Notice that all three facts that they, that they offer when they say, Lord, Lord, starts out with we or I. I prophesied in your name. I cast out devils in your name. I performed miracles. Don't I qualify for heaven? Let's just look at this other passage because it deals with the same issues. It, it's Luke chapter, anybody that has a harmony of the gospel will find this, but Luke chapter 13 verses 23 to 30, and I'll just read it very quickly. Someone asked him, Lord, are only a few people going to be saved? He said to them, make every effort to enter through the narrow door, the narrow door where you can take nothing that belongs to you, because many, I tell you, will try to enter and will not be able to. Once the owner of a house gets up and closes the door, you will stand outside knocking and pleading, sir, open the door for us. But he, will, but he will answer, I don't know you or where you come from. Then you will say, we ate and drank with you. <laughs> Talking about the Lord's Supper, you know. <laughs> and, and taught in our streets. But he will reply, I don't know you or where you come from. Away from me, all you evildoers. There will be weeping there and gnashing of teeth. When you see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, but you yourselves thrown out, people will come from east and west and north and south and will take their places at the feast of the kingdom of God. Indeed, there are those who are last who will be first, and first who will be last. You see, this group that I'm talking about, and the reason I say they're the worst group, because they're the believers and they're going, happy are they. They're the unbelievers and they're going to confess, you know, Jesus was righteous, we got our just due. We didn't believe him. But these people who say, hey, I cast out demons, I prophesied, I did all of these things, I know I'm going. And they're not going. You see, they have not enjoyed this world and they won't get to enjoy eternal life either. So they are, of all people, the most sorry. When it comes to first and last, we could go into a whole thing about Jews and Gentiles. Paul deals with the, the subject matter in Romans and I'm not going to do that right now. I'm going to, to leave that uh, alone. But it is uh, a consideration when you talk about being first and last. But let me go this way, and I'm beginning to summarize. All our righteous acts, prophesying in Christ's name, doing good works, casting out devils, if motivated by self-interest, are like filthy rags. Again, that's what John was saying before. So this is not a mystery study. Instead of faith in our performance, our faith has to be in Christ. I, um, 
I had quoted Isaiah. I zipped by that slide. Because it's important to understand what sin is. See, some people don't think that they're sinning. And they're blatantly sinning. So let's let me read this for you. Isaiah chapter 64 and verse 6. Because we know we can agree that sin won't enter the kingdom. So if people don't enter the kingdom, even though they're prophesying and casting out demons in the name of God, then there must be some sin. Does that make sense to you? Is there any other reason to be lost other than sin? Huh? Of course not. Sin it is. So let's talk about what sin is. Maybe that's important. Isaiah 64 and verse 6 says, All of us have become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous acts are like filthy rags. We are all shriveled up like a leaf, and like the wind, our sins sweep us away. So sometimes we forget who we are because of the righteous acts we attempt to do or we actually do. And we need to remember that the reason we're saved is because of God's grace and mercy. So where's your confidence? In your works or in Christ? I trust it is in Christ because that's the only place that it should be. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 3 says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Those who are poor in spirit, those are people that have don't have confidence in their performance. They don't have confidence in what they do. Their confidence is in Jesus Christ and his grace, his power, and his mercy. So everyone that hears the words and acts on them may be compared to a wise man who built his house on a rock. Who's the rock? Jesus, right? That's verse 24. A true Christian will do many wonderful works, but a true Christian will not depend on them for his or her standing before God. Our works in and of themselves are as filthy rags. Finally, don't say I don't need to study because I'm in Christ. <laughs> we need to study. Why? John 6, 54, 57 says, what? What does it say? Whosoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is real food, and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in him. Just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me will live forever. What is this flesh? What's the living word? It's the Bible. So we need regular, consistent Bible study. I thought I would end with this text. This is Christ's conclusion, the Sermon on the Mount. He wants us to build on the solid rock, which is himself. 1 Corinthians 10, 4, for they drank of from the, or they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, 
and that rock was Christ. I want you to understand that no matter who we are, it's not possible for us to do anything to affect our entrance into the kingdom. Those going in will be those who are totally dependent on Christ for their salvation and who know it, who, who don't get caught up by the gifts that have been given. You know, sometimes you may think that your spiritual gift is absent. You don't seem to have any. Some of you may feel that your gift is overshadowed by others with seemingly greater and more flamboyant gifts. Each person is given a gift as the Spirit sees fit. And if we're in Christ, we yield to His divine will. And we say, thank you, Jesus, for that which you have given me. And perhaps when we get to eternity, to, be, to enjoy eternity, we'll, we'll understand better why we're not some of the things we wish we could have been. We must learn to be satisfied with what Christ has made us and desires of us and give him all the glory and the honor for everything, including being able to give a Bible study, being able to preach, being able to teach, being able to have compassion. In and of themselves, those things mean nothing. Only as we manifest the love of Christ and a desire to do his will will we be among the first group believers who are saved I hope this has been something that will cause you to think will cause you to study even more I challenge you in fact to take the text Matthew chapter 7 verses 21 through 23 and you can actually do 24 to the end as well and contemplate it look up look into it yourself because it, it's quite sobering those who prophesy and say Lord Lord doesn't mean everyone is going and many many who do so are not going may it not be you May it not be me, but may we be found faithful, holding on to the rock and in the kingdom. That's my prayer. Thanks for joining. Thanks for coming. Look forward to seeing you next week. We'll have another study. We certainly will get out to you uh, by way of announcement in the, in the newsletter, the topic, and, um, and I think that you will be blessed. Welcome back. Uh, we're here and uh, we look forward to talking with you. If you have questions or if you have a topic you wish to hear presented, uh, please please contact us at ministry at inspiritednetwork.com. We'll be more than happy to respond and to consider those topics. Father, thank you for this opportunity to share our faith. We recognize that all that we do and all that we say only has power and is only fitting if it comes from you. I pray, Father, that we will love as you have taught us to love by decision rather than by feeling. And I ask that you send your Holy Spirit to strengthen each of us so that in Christ we'll have the strength to do all that you would have us do, to bear our crosses, to deny ourselves, and to follow you. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Have a great evening and rest of the week, and I look forward to seeing you on next Thursday. Good night.